All right, so good evening and welcome to the sixth installment of the Virtual Village, Mindset, Mastery, and Marginalization. My name is David Banks. I'm the president and CEO of the Eagle Academy Foundation. Um, we, I operate a network of six public schools here in the New York City area and one in Newark, New Jersey. So today, currently, we have 3,000 young men across our schools. Our schools range from grade six to grade 12. And we have over 1,500 alum who graduated and gone off to colleges and universities all across the country. Our work started back in 2004 together with the 100 black men because at that time we were absolutely responding to a national crisis. And that national crisis had everything to do with the marginalization of young men of color. And at that time, there were two things which really prompted us to start our work. One, the graduation rate for African-American males in New York City was only 32%, which was just astounding on its face. The other thing was that Columbia University had just put out a report which said that 75% of the inmates from the New York State correctional system came from seven neighborhoods in New York City. So we thought that those, that information was just devastating and we needed to do something about it. Uh, we had always mentored young people. We tried to provide money for scholarships, but we knew that we needed to, to do more than that because we were certainly in the middle of a crisis. And that's what gave rise to our creating the Eagle Academy for young men as the first all boys public high school in New York City when we opened our doors in 2004. And today we see ourselves in an even deeper crisis, not only for young men of color, but for so many people of color. And that's why I'm thrilled to be with, all, be with you today and to have so many of you join us. When I ask that you text your friends to share this video, use the hashtags EAFNYC as well as hashtag virtual village. Tonight, we'll be focused on remote learning, the future of education, and the impact of the pandemic, and now this current movement to disrupt systemic racism, what that will have on students, the impact that that will have on students of color in particular. So joining me tonight are Dr. Lester Young, region at large from the University of the State of New York, Sal Khan, founder and CEO of the Khan Academy, and Dr. Joanna Johnson, the Chief Achievement Officer for the Eagle Academy Foundation. Um, so let me offer up a little bit more about each one of our guests who are here today. Uh, Dr. Lester Young, the New York State, was appointed uh, by the New York State Legislature as a region at large. Dr. Young co-chairs the Peter 12 Education Committee and the Regents Work Group on Early Learning and early childhood education. He chairs the region's work group to improve outcomes for boys and young men of color. His leadership in this area led to the establishment of the New York State My Brother's Keeper Initiative. Welcome, Dr. Young. Thank you. Thank you. Sal Khan is the founder and CEO of Khan Academy, a nonprofit with the mission of providing a free education for anyone, anywhere. Khan Academy offers free lessons in math, history, grammar, physics, biology, and many more subjects. High school students use official SAT practice on Khan Academy to prepare for the SAT for free. Teachers use Khan Academy to make assignments, track progress, identify gaps in learning, and provide tailored instruction. Today, more than 61 million registered users access Khan Academy in dozens of languages in more than 190 countries. Sal, thank you for joining us this evening. Great to be here. And finally, Dr. Joanna Johnson, who currently serves as the Chief Achievement Officer for the Eagle Academy Foundation, where she uses strategy to support coach and train leaders from across Eagle Academy's network of six schools and EAF's national school partners. Dr. Johnson is a career educator 
was dedicated the past 23 years to improving outcomes for black and brown children. She started as a chemistry and biology teacher in Brooklyn. She was in fact the de facto assistant principal for our flagship Eagle Academy in the Bronx and served as the principal of the Harlem Children's Zone Promise Academy High School. Dr. Johnson, welcome. Dr. Thank Johnson, you. all right. You can hear me? Yes. All right, very good. So to our viewers, please submit your questions in the comment section. We will do our best to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. And so with that, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna open up Dr. Young with you. Um, first question that I have for you really is, given this current climate and context, and how it's fostered a discussion and a debate about systemic racism within policing and criminal justice. Yet we know systemic racism is evident across institutions. Schools are not exempt. What reforms do you believe are necessary for schools if we are to realize success for all students, especially black and brown young men? Okay, well, thank you uh, for allowing me to be here with you. And, and this is, I, I think, the topic um, of, of this time, this moment. Uh, and so here are a couple of observations. The data around the current crisis has told us what we've already known anecdotally, that number one, place matters. Uh, the COVID pandemic has, has impacted communities very differently across the nation and across New York State. Uh, I would add that the very communities that were identified in the Columbia University study are the same communities that have been most impacted by the pandemic. The other, the other challenge that you have in terms of education is that we know that those communities are the very communities where young people to this day, there are still youngsters all across New York State and particularly in New York City that have not had access to appropriate remote instruction as well as access to any type of real instruction. Mm. And so the issue for us has to be, and I think the issue of the day and the reform that's needed is that once and for all, what do we put in place to ensure that there's real racial equity in terms of supporting young people in New York State as well as the country? So how do we center the discussion around racial equity? Now, that might seem simple, but what I will say to you, it be, it, it's the cause of lots of stress among policymakers. What are, you, what are your, some of your suge suggestions? I don't, I don't think it sounds simple at all. Um, and I know that this is something that people have raised all across the nation. Um, but given your background, your experience, uh, you know, you are, you, I consider you the dean of the delegation. There's so many educators all across New York who, who look to you uh, as their mentor, uh, myself included. What, what do we have to do in terms of policy changes that need to be made, particularly in light of everything that's going on, on right now? So uh, the, the first thing that has to happen, um, even before we get to the actual policy changes and initiatives, is that we've got a, we have the wrong leadership models. And mm -hmm. so right now, unfortunately, um, the, the type of leadership that's needed in a, in a moment where we're talking about racial equity is, is a leadership that's grounded in integrity and courage. So what we have and what, what I've actually seen is that uh, uh, number one, that's been lacking. And number two, if you, if you were to ask me quite candidly, the kind of leadership that, that we've seen, and I think we see this at the national level, is is a type of leadership that's uh, tip, uh, 
could be described as as kind of like an ethic, ethical egoism. You know, mm. it's all about me. You know, uh, how does it further uh, my professional goals? Uh, how do I satisfy uh, different stakeholders? Um, how do I do everything but address the real issue? And I think topic the topic of equity has always been a stressful has always been stressful. Um, people see this as, well, what are you asking me to give up? Um, mm -hmm. what, what I say very simply is this, that if we can change the prevailing narrative in our most impacted communities, that will have a positive impact on the entire state and the country. I would say thank you, thank you so much, Sal. What 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 opportunities? I'm sure you've been paying close attention to everything that's been going on here. Um, are you based here in New York, Sal, or where are you? I'm out here in, in Northern California. Okay, so you've not been in the middle of all these protests that are going I, I, on across the I, Brooklyn I have Bridge. Not. I have not. <laughs> What opportunities has this shutdown and shift to remote learning presented and what are some best practices for virtual learning? Yeah, you know, and, and you know, just to be clear, it, there, there's definitely some opportunities I'll talk about, but this is definitely a very suboptimal situation as a whole. Uh, you know, uh, as was just mentioned, you have a large, you know, everyone's out of school and whatever inequities there were before, the the virtual version of it, unfortunately, has been, for the most part, more pronounced, uh, where on top of, uh, you know, the, the, the schools that had the resources or could even assume the resources at home to have technology access, et cetera, et cetera, they were able to lean in a little bit more into the virtualization and video conferencing, whatever else. And then the schools where there were already a lot of needs and the, the families at home didn't have access they weren't able to learn into it. So now on top of all of the other issues, the kids aren't learning as much and they're disengaged. And, you know, we've talked to uh, school districts around the country, including New York City public schools. But, you know, I remember I, we're very close to Clark County, which is Las Vegas. Um, we, we have a lot of work with them. And, you know, the superintendent's telling me that first few weeks, they, they, they just lost track of 10 or 15% of their students. They just don't even know where they, where they went. I mean, over time, they were able to so, so there's a, a huge, huge uh, disruption and all of the data, you know, su summer, there, the summer slide is well documented. It's not only a time when, when kids um, forget, or not where they don't learn, it's a time where they, where they forget. And now we're going to have whatever you want to call it, a, a five, six month COVID slide. Right. And awesome. what we know is there's Let's always help. a variance in student preparedness and student engagement going into a, a new school year. This year is going to be that much wider and unfortunately it's going to correlate even more with some of the things I just talked about. So those are, I guess, the, the, the not so great news that I think a lot of folks know about. The yeah. opportunity, and right. it's not perfect, is, you know, people have been talking about the digital divide forever. Uh, I, I think actually, you know, our, our country has actually done a decent job, not a perfect job, getting digital access within schools over the last 10 years. I remember 10 years ago, a lot of schools I would go to like, well, we don't have you know, we're not going to be able to do this in school for the most part because of E-rate and other things. The school-based programs have gotten a lot better, still not perfect, but this has put a big spotlight on the home access issue. Uh, and it's not just for academic, it's, it's frankly for economic empowerment, and it's frankly for mental health right now. Like, what would we do right now if we weren't able to get on Zoom with you know, friends and family right now? So we've seen, as far as I can tell from my vantage point, fairly heroic efforts on the part of school districts, governments, philanthropists to try to close as much of the digital divide as they can in record time. New York City public schools, uh, you know, I was talking to uh, Richard Carranza a couple of weeks ago, you know, from what I can tell has, you know, right. tried to distribute nearly 300,000 devices, worked with the local telecom carriers uh, to get in home, insure the devices, because, you know, that has all sorts of other issues around people just feeling scared to almost use it. Um, right. and, and I'm sure it hasn't been perfect, but you know, Absolutely. that's the right direction. And I, I I've got to believe, and you know, we've heard similar stories in Miami and Los Angeles and in Las Vegas is that once that happens, you can't take that back. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's one silver lining. I think another silver lining is, 
you know, there's just an open mindedness right now that there hasn't been, you know, as long as I've been kind of working in this, just, you know, everything's been thrown in the air. And so people are having to say, all right, how do we, well, how do we rebuild in this very uncertain times? Obviously we've had the last two, three months of closures. Uh, we are trying to help work with people to how do we keep learning over the summer and everyone knows this coming back to school is going to be really bizarre. It's going nice. to be socially distance shift based. No matter what you do, some kids are going to have to stay at home before we know it, October, November, we might have to shut down again. And nice. so it's making everyone ask questions like how do we ensure that learning is not bound by time or space? That was always an important question. How do we make sure that kids get active learning? Because we all recognize when you're on Zoom, if it's just a one-way lecture, it might as well be a video. Well, that's actually true even in a lecture hall. Uh, so people are asking that. How do, we, how do we make sure that students have the opportunity and the incentive to identify and fill in gaps that they have? Like we're actually hearing people talk about this right now. And I know you all care a lot about mastery and personalization as well, but I'm, I'm hearing that as part of the conversation. And then people are also saying, what can we do asynchronously with tools like Khan Academy, mm -hmm. and then what, is, what do we have to do right on the synchronous in-person or virtually right. in-person interaction? So I think those are all very positive conversations, and it is creating openings for new ways of thinking about things going, going into the school year. And, and I, think, I think these are a lot of questions that have been posed and recognizing that we're, we're in a new terrain, right? So there have been lots of questions. I sit on the mayor's committee here in New York that's looking at, you know, the... Uh, how do we get back into schools, the re-entry into schools uh, in September? And, and we haven't heard a lot of answers just yet. It's still a lot of questions that have been posed. Have you, is there any place that you've seen or heard from around the country that seems most or more promising than other places perhaps? So as an example, you talk about here in New York, 300,000 know, uh, know, Chromebooks distributed, seems impressive. You know, New York has big numbers on everything that we do. But teachers didn't really receive much in the way of real training in, in, in how to do effective virtual teaching. We just started teaching virtually. <laughs> and, um, but is there any place that you've seen around the country that seems to be getting it more right or maybe a step or two ahead of some other districts around the, around the nation? I, I, I'm not sure. You know, I've, 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 we're close to many large school and, and small school districts, you know, fr from what I'm hearing anecdotally, I'm hearing, you know, I just told the story about New York, but you're right. Like, what are you going to do with those laptops, et cetera? Uh, you know, I've always been impressed with what Alber Alberto Carvalho has been doing in Miami-Dade and, you know, at least in conversations, they seem to have a, a pretty a well thought out plan. But I do see that there's a, you know, just a general, you know, people are, people are only just getting over the fact that this coming back to school is like, you know, they've just gotten out of the room with the epidemiologists. Like, and so, they, so they now know what the epidemiologists are telling them to do. And so they know the constraints that they're going to deal with. And I do think there's a huge vacuum right now of like, well, but how do we actually educate? And, you know, we've had a few months. So it's not, you know, a few months ago, it was like three days notice. So it's kind of like, let's, let's wing it. But, you know, we've had time to think about it. And I don't think it's going to be as acceptable to say winging it, can, you know, all we're so, we're trying to do what we can. We're happy to work with anyone. We, you know, Khan Academy, we've always viewed as a strategic supplement, not the full curriculum. Uh, for sure, not the whole experience. You know, something to support the teacher, never a replacement for what you can get from an amazing in-person interaction. Uh, but obviously, people are leaning more in these times. And we realize that, you know, if there's a vacuum of understanding what to do, maybe we can fill some of that in. So we're going to, you know, we've been working on learning plans. What are reasonable expectations over the course of the year? We're working on uh, these whole new set of courses called get ready to for grade level courses so that uh, teachers can let students learn at their own time pace very quickly, build mm -hmm. their foundations, identify gaps. Um, I'm, you know, I'm even having conversations with many groups of, can we at least give people an example of what a baseline experience should look like? Uh, you know, it should be three 45 minute synchronous sessions with no more than this many students. And these are the problems you can cover. And, the, and, and then maybe one of those sessions should be smaller groups uh, to review goals. And then you should expect to do this much asynchronous work on Khan Academy. And that's a math class. You know, you could imagine science or humanities class a little different. But I'm hoping yeah. that we can help put some of that together. And I hope other folks can, can do it, too, because people are a little lost right now. So yeah. uh, could I just add to that uh, what I heard? Because I, I think that's, that, that's right on point. But one of the other challenges I think that we're facing, particularly um, in the communities that have been and the and the demographics that have been most impacted is that 
in those communities, there also needs to be a way to figure out how do we help young people gain a, substan a substantial amount of progress that's sustainable over a shorter period of time. The, 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 the sad truth is many of these communities, these young people were already behind. They're further behind now. And so the question becomes, is there an opportunity? And I believe there is. I mean, I, I actually today, um, not, not an advertisement, but I actually went on uh, the Khan Academy uh, reconstruction unit and looked at that. And I actually think there's a way um, to match the technology so that young people um, can make a substantial amount of progress in a short period of time that's sustainable um, over years. And that's really the challenge for us if we're ever going to get some equity in terms of outcome. I want to come back to you about that in just a moment. I want to, I want to bring uh, Dr. Johnson into this conversation, but I'm, but I'm very intrigued by that, uh, doc, Dr. Young, about what it will take to uh, close that gap uh, maybe quicker than we might otherwise realize. Right. Uh, uh, but Dr. Johnson, you know, in terms of mindset, right? Um, you know, how do we shift mindsets in school and with the, in school and district leaders, first of all, as well as teachers regarding their expectations for children of color and their potential? Well, actually, I think that's a great question. Um, I actually think the two experts that we have on the panel, I think an intersection of their experience works. I think um, this idea of how you leverage uh, resources like Khan Academy that provide that supplemental support, this mm -hmm. notion that you don't come smart, that you get smart, um, and mm -hmm. that there's work that you can do to really kind of shift. I think we need leaders who first embrace that, um, mm -hmm. accept that, and then support policies that allow educators to do that. And so simple things like encouraging your educators to allow students to preview topics before you cover those topics, um, being transparent about what's coming next. Um, it's not like we walk in and, and it, it's a mystery. Student, soon as students walk in, whatever the, the learning target is of the day, I'm as just as surprised as, as you are. But this idea of being transparent at the front end um, for educators and then for leaders to really kind of support this notion of how do we put forth, these are the sets of expectations and the sets of goals that students can move towards. And I think if leaders have a mastery disposition, this idea that here is the destination. Here are the set of things that we expect students to be able to demonstrate and to accomplish to show success. Not 150 items, but a, but a core set. And as students work, that there are indicators along the way and that there are benchmarks along the way that allow students to measure themselves. And so I think about using Khan Academy to go, and actually to, to get more information about, um, about what's happening in the world now, um, to find out when they talked about acute respiratory distress as a, as, a, as a circumstance of coronavirus. I was like, well, what is that? And so I went on, I started Googling, I looked and there was a short video that talked about um, respiratory function. And so just like that, as a, as a lay person, as a learner, I wanted a piece of information, I went, I sought it out, and I pursued that. And so this idea of how we leverage creativity, how we support educators as they think about pushing students towards a set of goals of mastery so that it's not a secret, it's not a mystery around what it takes to, to be proficient in sixth grade ELA, and then being intentional around some of the foundational supports that are required. I think it, it, it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. I think to Dr. Young's point around this, this idea of leadership that requires integrity and courage, you can't be afraid to say, there are 150 standards that are out here, but we've looked at it, and in our comprehensive five through eight program, our six through 12 program, we're gonna tackle and chip away at these things systematically and really help to reinforce for our students. And we're gonna be honest about where the students have gaps and figure out ways that we can leverage technology to help us to fill those gaps in a shorter period of time. Well, I wanna connect that's that to- No, no, that's great. I wanna connect that to, uh, and go back to Dr. Young um, in terms of your thoughts again around how we can start to, to, close, some of the, to close some of these gaps. Um, where some people think, you know, this, this loss 
is going to be something that's going to impede our young people for years. Um, you seem to you seem to think otherwise. What what what, what do you think? Well, it, he, here's what I think. I think that we we um, the leadership we have to challenge the our old modes of thinking. Um, here we are in the 21st century, and we're still basing education around Carnegie units and seat time. That is a, a definite barrier to what we're talking about. Yes. I mean, we're, we're in a very different time now. You can, you can actually go on the internet and see an entire curriculum from kindergarten all the way through high school, yet we require young people to say, well, you've got to do 16 weeks, you've got to do this many hours. Uh, one of the things that, and this is just an anecdotal account, I was talking with a, um, a, a history teacher uh, in an alternative high school, and she said to me that she had students that were actually logging in at 2 a.m. I said, I said, what do you mean logging at 2 a.m.? She says, well, you know, this, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm an alternative high school and my students are in families where the other adults lost their jobs and these students had to go to work. work. Mm -hmm. And so they were logging in at 2 a.m. And so here, here's what I'm saying. There, is, there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. And so what the opportunity that Sal was talking about, we have a tremendous opportunity now to think about the whole process of schooling differently. And it just seems to me that, that if we're focused on, on addressing the disparities and ensuring that all young people have, have this equitable access, then we've gotta be more flexible in our thinking. And, and I think that's supported by all the available research and the data but again, what it requires are, I, I said, uh, integrity and courage, but it also requires imagination. And, and I think that's the other part to this that I, that I struggle with, that, that when I look at our schools of education and I look at our, our, our leadership preparation programs, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm saying to you courage, integrity, and imagination. Um, I'm not certain that, that those are the values that are held in those institutions. So I think we have to take this as an opportunity to rethink how we offer schooling, how we prepare people, and clearly what are our values and standards for performance in schools and classrooms. I, I would like, to, I would like to, to actually take that and move that around the room. I'll start with you, Sal. What, 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 we've been hearing this across the country that this pandemic, much less the, the crisis that we're also looking at out here in terms of this institutional racism and police brutality, but seeing this as an opportunity, what you hear across the nation, this, this idea that when we return to school, we should be doing schooling differently. In your mind and what you've seen and through your work, what does that look like to you? What do you think about if you were constructing it in a way that you think really makes the most, the most sense what would school look like? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I could go on for hours, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to- <laughs> You can take a to, few minutes. I'll, I'll plug a book. <laughs> no, well, I mean, you know, I, I so simple answer, um, you know, a lot of it has nothing to do with technology. I mean, people associate me with technology, but you know, right. the first thing is I would question summer vacations in the school day. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, most of us are not farmers anymore, uh, but that's when the school calendar was devised when you know kids and teachers and parents had to work on fields. The um, and then the the school day ends at you know depending on where you live two or three in the afternoon. It was designed for kind of a leave it to Beaver world where you know there's apple pie baking and you know and and dad comes home at five o'clock and you know everyone helps him take off his shoes or something. You know that's not the world that frankly most of us of us live in and and that that's a major source of inequity because. Uh, middle income and especially upper uh, income folks and affluent folks, they can schedule that summer with super enriching uh, uh, summer programs, academic mm -hmm. summer programs, or even even if it's a sports program, it's enriching. It builds, you know, whatever. It's, it's building many different muscles. And then the same thing is happening when you when you know, uh, frankly, any of our kids come home at three o'clock if they need help or support. 
Uh, we either can give it to them directly or we can find something online or we could get a tutor or there's multiple ways of getting support. But for a lot of families, three o'clock, the supports end. Uh, right. And if anything, responsibilities might, might, might begin to, to Dr. Young's point. And so that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is what both Dr. Young and Dr. Johnson have been talking about, which is make it, make it mastery based, make it competency based, set the set where we need to get to and, and then set tell one go. If you get here, you you did it. And uh, then that liberates the whole system of thinking about, well, what is the right way to achieve those goals for uh, different students? And then the other power of it is it allows, you know, to, to Dr. Johnson's point of view, this whole, you know, this notion of growth mindset is very in vogue these days. You know, everyone loves saying growth mindset, which I do too, you know, pro, you know, failures just, you know, fail forward. Um, you know, that's not who you are. It's a process. It's where you're growing. But our, our fixed pace grading system is inherently all about a fixed mindset. Right. You get a 70% on a test when you're in fifth grade on decimals, you get that C, you know, figuratively branded on you. Like you are a C student. That's who you are. You're, that defines your being. It puts in your permanent transcript. And then even later on, you load that the dividing decimals. Uh, you, that C is still there. It's still telling yeah. you uh, that you're, you're not smart. And so competency-based learning, master learning, whatever you want to call it. Hey, at any point, maybe you're, you're to C, but that's only for now. And at any right. point, you have the incentives and the ability and the motivation to be able to go back and get it to a, an A. And that's not just for your self-esteem. That's not just to kind of make your transcript look. It's, it's crucial in so many uh, subjects uh, so that you don't hit walls later on. You know, there's a teacher in Hesperian, California. It's in the Central Valley serving a very high need group of kids. 90% of them free and reduced lunch. 90% of them enter his sixth grade classroom, mm -hmm. uh, several grade levels behind. And what he has them do is he has them start on Khan Academy at the very basics, you know, literally basic arithmetic, one plus one. Obviously, a lot of kids know that they accelerate really fast through it, but there are gaps in their not. They've, they've shown up with gaps and everyone's just been going through the motions year after year. And then he has them work at their own time place and mastery framework. If they haven't gotten to where they need to get to, they just haven't gotten there yet. And by the end of the school year, he has 90% of them at grade level or above. So you're seeing a, a group of kids, and these are a lot of kids that folks would point to and say, well, I'm not sure about those kids. I'm not sure right. if they can do it. Uh, but it's clear you can do it. And he's not doing anything magical. He's not using you know, million-dollar tools or anything like that. But yeah. it's his faith in them that they just need to fill in their gaps. So those are the two big ones. And I think yeah. you know, the, 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 the last one, I guess I said I could talk for hours about this. <laughs> that was great. Is, you, you know, I, I, would, I would love to brainstorm. I mean, we talk about imagination and you know, with Dr. Young and, and, and as, as a regent, you know, how can that mastery on platforms like Khan Academy, how can that translate into credit? And frankly, not just at the high school level, but potentially at the college level. Absolutely. You know, right now we focus on things like AP, but that's kind of an elite thing. It's right. only for, you know, some kids, so to speak. Um, but you know, we all know college algebra is the single biggest gating factor for so many kids right. in this country. 70% right. of kids in this country have to take remediation, which is essentially sixth or seventh grade math. Uh, and, and what if, you know, instead of us saying the high school system is all about making you college ready and then you, you, know, you hopefully get placed at least at the college algebra. What if when you take algebra two at the end of the year, you got 80% mastery on Khan Academy, we'll give you the college algebra credit, done. Right. Like we've, and, and you know what, if you're only at 60 or 70% by the end of the year, we're not going to call you a failure. We're just going to say, keep working on it. You got the That's summer, you got next year, you have the year after that, keep working on it. That's right. I love it. I love it. Dr. Johnson, you want to respond to any of that or otherwise your, your thoughts around, you know, the reimagination of what schools should look like? So absolutely. Um, I agree with the, the, the notion of the competency base. Um, I also think this, um, the opportunity for choice. So I think, I think of kind of a nuance, kind of a mandated choice, like you're mandated to have the arts, but you choose what art it is that you, you use for required some type of sport but you choose from whatever that sport could be but this idea of how we we move past just reading just writing to really talk about those things that that um, encourage creativity that um, encourage critical thinking that encourage collaboration and that demonstrate and highlight different types of interest the beauty of mastery and competency work is that it's not just about reading and writing 
because you might be incredibly proficient in art. Um, you may be a talented writer. And so you may need to continue to work at your math. And so this idea of how we create spaces where people understand that I am stronger in one area and I can reinforce and fortify in another area, it helps to really get students and people better equipped to move into the world and function um, in whatever station they choose that they elect to move into. So whether it's a corporate space, an entrepreneurial space, but just this idea of how we build this independence. If nothing else from this, this pandemic space, one of the things that we, we've learned is that students don't necessarily have this driving motivation. Some of our top students, without the compulsory nature of school, found themselves questioning how and why and where do I fit in? And so how we allow students to, to cultivate the things that they're interested in, the things that they're passionate about, but that we provide a mandate that they get a diversity of experience. And so you find a space, you know, the, those people who went to college and said, I, I never wanted to take a language again. And then you move into our current world where being bilingual is a talent. It's not, it's, it's not a, a detriment. People try to avoid math. But this idea of how we create spaces where people can move towards a competency where there's not a judgment, where it's untimed and it's ungraded. And so it is, you get there. So whether it takes you two years to get there or it takes you six months to get there, there's an opportunity for you to move and aspire to get towards that goal. Um, and then I guess the other part is, how we talk about this notion of dual languages, how we get people to be bicultural and have an understanding of kind of the culture of dominance and the culture of, of whatever, the, whatever that common culture is, but also understanding different cultures. So understanding your own culture and understanding another culture. And so whether or not your culture is mainstream culture, whether or not your culture is not one has been prioritized in curricular works, but that you are at least bicultural, if not, um, and not multicultural in, a, in, in, the, in the traditional way, but that you have a deeper and have a grounded um, knowledge within your own culture that you feel proud of who you are and have a good understanding of who you are and what the historical contributions your people have made, but also an understanding of at least the contributions of at least one other different type of culture. Now, now all, that, all of that is amazing, right? I mean, and that's what education should be. Um, yeah. Dr. Young, I, I've talked to so many school leaders across the country. Uh, but, you know, primarily right here in New York State, who, when given the opportunity, the kinds of ideas that they come up with that will spark creativity and imagination and really developing lifelong learners, they feel as though we can't operate in that prism because we're, we're bound by a system that is only measuring certain aspects of development, i.e., standardized exams, regents exams, um, and that that's how they're being judged. They said, if, I, if, if we were being judged differently, I could unleash the full power of creativity and imagination, but, and my team and my teachers, but we just feel like we're kind of walking within a box and trying to do the best that we can within that box. And we know that within that box, we've only been able to you know, we've kind of tapped out. We've realized, you know, we've only gotten as far, pretty much as far as we seem to be able to go. NAEP scores haven't incre increased much in the last 40 years. Um, we, we, we tried different strategies, but essentially it's the same thing. It's because something is wrong with the box. The box itself is limiting. So I know before the pandemic hit that the regents were on a statewide tour to take a look at and hear from the community about some possibilities of change. Any thoughts about that? Um, sure, um, uh, several, and and I feel like I could go on about on this topic forever. Uh, but let me uh, confine it to just a couple of of points. Um, number one, we're operating in a system that essentially creates winners and losers, and and that is a reflection of our thinking, right? So so I would say to you, the core mission of schooling is learning. Right, and, and so the big debate is how do we define learning? Currently, we're defining it as, well, what, what do you, you know, where, do you, where are you in terms of proficiency on a state exam? And, and here's the problem. That process only creates winners and losers. And those communities, those people with the greatest, uh, the largest percentage of the resources, whatever they are, human capital and or other, are always going to come out on top of that. And so it seems to me that 
that we've got to rethink, um, and that's the attractive part of competency-based instruction. Um, the other part to it is that we don't do is young people have to understand their own metacognitive process, right? So how, so how do I learn? What is my particular learning process? The way we uh, pro uh, uh, provide instruction doesn't always allow that. So if you ask a young person, just, just, just typically tell me what you're good at. You know, what, what subject area are you good at? What are you weak at? And can you tell me why? Can you tell me why you're good at this? Most of our young people have no idea how to even approach that. And so it seems to me that we've got to change our whole approach. Um, uh, Dr. Johnson talked about motivation. Motivation is a principle of learning, right? Part of the reason why young people appear not to be motivated is because they see school as a place where I have not been successful. That is a place where I don't build my esteem. And so why should I try. In fact, there are a lot of researchers that say that 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 this notion, uh, Claude Steele said it many, many years ago in terms of stereotype threat. There are a lot of young people who say, well, look, the pain of failure is so great. So if I don't try, I won't fail. I won't experience that pain. So why should I try? Well, that's a function of the way we have provided education. And, and it seems to me that what we do or, or what we've been doing across the country is that we are expecting the students to adapt to our methods when we should be the ones who are adapting to the needs of our young people. And that's a whole different mindset. And, and again, I, I say it starts with the leadership, right? It starts with leaders who are, who are prepared to say once and for all, look, there's a different way um, to provide instruction. There is a different way that we ought to be looking at the school calendar. There's a different way that we ought to be looking at the school day. And we have to be prepared to buck all of the barriers that prohibit us from doing that. So I believe it all starts with leadership. And if we don't put these things on the table, I mean, and, and let's be candid. I mean, there are lots of reasons why, and, and, and you all have heard this, right? Uh, the contract says I can't do this. Um, the policy says I can't do this. You know, they have to have 44 credits in order to graduate. They have to take and pass five regions in order to get a high school diploma. Well, they, they, they have 44 credits, they've taken and passed five regions, and then when they get to City College, they still have to take remedial courses. So what have we done? Right. You know, what have we done? And, and so if we haven't prepared our young people so that they're on a track to, to penetrate the middle class, we failed. Absolutely. I mean, we've just absolutely failed them. So I think this is a moment, this is an opportunity, for real leaders to step forward, right? And, and, and I think that's really the issue, that, that in this moment when we are actually looking at what's happening, this is an opportunity for leaders to step forward and say now is the time for us to really figure out how we can do things differently. Um, so maybe I should just stop. Yeah, there. no, and I, listen, I'm, I'm with you. And I, and, and, and I think, um, I think that Hopefully we have leaders who are prepared and are visionary and responsive enough to change. But beyond hopefully, I, I, I see this pandemic and this, this outcry that's happening in the streets as an opportunity to force those folks who are in power to begin to look at this very differently. It's, right now the focus is on kind of the criminal justice system. The people who have been in power, you know, we've heard a lot of the rhetoric for years providing more training for, 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 for uh, uh, police officers and blah, 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 blah. But now uh, this notion of arresting people, right? Prosecuting people, prosecuting police officers who are just sitting around and watching what's happening. See, that's taking it to a new level. That didn't come from the leadership. That, that came from the people putting the pressure on. And I think it just denotes something that's gonna have to happen in education because I don't think that those who are the leaders all have the level of um, sensitivity, consciousness that you do. Um, 
there's going to have to be a level of pressure that's going to be have to be brought to bear to go along with what Sal said. There's, it's a different day. This is not agrarian society anymore, but education moves very slowly and catching up. I want to share one personal story. I was, uh, I was given an honorary degree at Wheelock College in Boston several years ago, and the president of Wheelock called me to say, you've got three of your young men that you sent to us from the Eagle Academy. They didn't just show up on our campus here. They became leaders on this campus, and they're all getting ready to graduate, and I'd like to invite you to the graduation, and we want to present an honorary degree to you for your work that you're doing on behalf of all these young men with Eagle. So it was great. I showed up in Boston. I, I got up on the stage. Somebody from the Board of Trustees and somebody from the faculty flanked me. The president got ready to, to say what she wanted to say about me. And right before she could speak, all three of the young men from Eagle Academy, on their graduation day, in an auditorium of over three or 4,000 people, stood up and said, out of the night, that covers me. Black is the pit from pole to pole. I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. They recited the poem Invictus, which is the poem of resilience that Nelson Mandela recited every day that he was on Robbins Island. He said that's what kept him alive. That, that has been seared into the consciousness of all the young men at the Eagle Academy. And in that moment, they were paying tribute to the organization and the schooling that they got that got them to where they were. One of them went off to pursue a dual PhD program at Purdue University. Another one went off uh, to work for a communications firm there in Boston. Another one went to Africa uh, uh, for a, uh, another program that he, was a, that he was a part of. By all indications, you would say it was a success. All three of these guys graduated. They went on to be able to be productive citizens um, and, and move on with their lives. When we came back and we ran the numbers, we found out that each one of those three young men was considered not ready by the New York State Education Department, not college ready by the New York State Education Department. Why? Because college readiness is only determined by the score that you got on your ELA and your math exam. Doesn't determine anything else. Didn't measure grit. Didn't measure your focus and your drive and all the other things that you had to overcome. We know that those things are not easy to measure, but we must continue to figure out ways to do that because there are a lot of young people who have been Gotten that designation at South. Can, can I can can I can I say something also about yeah. that? See, see, there is something else uh, about the whole notion of relationships and building relationships, right? And and how there are certain things, you know, there, there's a there's a saying. Yes, teachers have to know their content. Um, they have to know how to deliver that content. Uh, but I believe one of the most important things that 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 educators have to know is they have to know their students and how they learn, right? right? So they have to, in that instance, they have to understand the power of ritual and tradition. And so I've now said that, that that's important, that it is very important because that's part of who, who young people happen to be. Now, if, 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 if you don't say that, See, where is that knowledge going to come from? And so what I'm, I'm saying something else also, uh, that the very young people that we're talking about, we have to ensure that people who have the expertise are at the table making the decisions. You see, one of the other things, and again, this gets back to um, ethics and integrity and courage. But one of the challenges that, that we have is that there are lots of people who are sitting at the table saying, this is what we ought to do, but their knowledge base is limited. Right. And so for me, the question becomes, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, we have to fix how we offer education, but we also have to examine how we're planning for and who's at the table. Right. So it's, 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 it's a several prong strategy, uh, but unless that happens, right, mm -hmm. uh, and unless you're focused on action, uh, so here's something else that we know. I started out saying that place matters, mm -hmm. right? right? Place right. matters. And, and so here's what I know. Schools in and of themselves can't solve all of this. However, we know that when there have been targeted approaches at most impacted communities 
and there's been a comprehensive approach, meaning that you've offered children and families whatever it is they needed to grow and develop. You've built capacity and there's been progress. Now, what that means is there has to be a major investment on the most impacted communities, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to actually say that, that, that uh, instead of spending $67,000 a year to keep a juvenile incarcerated in the state of New York, now just think about that, right? $67,000 a year to keep one young person incarcerated. And in New York State, we're spending as little in some places as thirteen thousand dollars to educate. So there's something wrong with the way we're we're thinking about development. The final piece that I'm going to say is that uh, I believe you mentioned this idea of development. Well, the the developmental pathways are not isolated, right? They all work together, mm -hmm. and so cognitive development is related to social development. Um, ethical, you know, emotional development, you know, how are you feeling physically, all of these things are inextricably connected. You can't just say we're going to focus on passing a test. Mm -hmm. that, that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to really rethink. And that's, and by the way, um, James Comer said that over 50 years ago. Right. And so part of, part of our problem is that there's this also this reluctance for us to look at well what actually works and are we doing what really works based on what we now know that's right absolutely that's right we're getting closer to the end i want to start to uh start to round this out the last uh couple of questions sal um so you've got parents and their, their children who are home they've been home for a while they've been cooped up we're starting to we're starting to kind of uh have some reemergence from the house. The weather is changing, at least here in New York. It's, I'm sure it's been nice in California for quite some time. Uh, but people are getting back out. But parents are still have still been struggling. Right? Many parents have already checked out of this process. What what last bit of advice would you offer? Some concrete things for young men, for young people, and their parents that they can be doing, whether it's through technology, not technology. I heard. I heard you on a show recently say, if you didn't do anything else, you can start preparing for the SAT. And you could, you could spend, I think, a half an hour every day uh, by doing some of the work that you put forth through the Khan Academy. Real solid practical advice around things that people can absolutely be doing right now. Yeah. No, I think one of the biggest mistakes or you know, issues that we've gone through the COVID is, you know, schools closed, parents are scrambling, trying to make sense. And it just seems so overwhelming. They just kind of give up at some point. I mean, I've, I've done that in my own household, especially with our <laughs> kindergarten. Uh, we're still figuring that out. But the- Right, God um, bless you. The, 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 the issue is to realize in anything, if you can actually put in 20, 30 minutes per day of focus practice, makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Right. Uh, you say know, that, say that again, Sal. Say that one more time because 20, 30 people minutes really a need day, to hear that. Focus practice, learning at your zone of proximal development, getting as much practice and feedback as possible can make a huge, huge difference. And you know that the three R's, I mean, I've always had trouble with it. It should be two R's and an A, but reading, writing, and arithmetic, <laughs> <laughs> those are still the, the key ones. And um, you, you know, I, I would say, you know, we're, we're known for, for math. We go into other subjects, but math is that one, you know, reading and writing, ideally you can practice those every day for 30 minutes and they can be very informal. It could be journaling, but just so it doesn't atrophy, but math, if you show up in at, at, at seventh grade and they're going to, you know, the teacher will assume you know how to divide decimals. And if you had that, got that 60% from fifth grade, it is very hard to engage. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you, if you did one, you know, we'll keep reading and writing ideally, but, uh, go start from the beginning and you know Khan Academy is there it's free it's not commercial it's funded by philanthropy it's there for folks to use it spend 20 30 minutes a day through the summer we've actually published learning plans that can keep people going we're about to publish these get ready for grade level courses we think hmm. kids could finish them in a couple of weeks and identify all of their gaps if 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 students are able to do that i think they're going to be very well prepared for the, the coming school year that's great that's great solid practical advice thank you so much uh, uh dr johnson um, final question I really have for you. H how do we prepare educators for this changing landscape that we're in, right? Uh, which requires them to leverage technology, 
and engage students and families within culturally responsive contexts. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think, um, I think like many things, the answer a lot of times lies within the room. I think we need an intergenerational strategy. I think we have a lot of young teachers. I think we have a lot of veteran teachers and being able to look at the intersection between um, people who are tech technology natives and pe people who are steeped within content and instructional strategies and thinking about opportunities for them to collaborate. I think being able to get teachers engaged in enough planning to think about outcomes and to think about learning, learning experiences um, and it relates to educators, but I think it also relates to how we shift the learning and the thinking to solving problems um, and getting students to think about how they are able to come together to solve problems. Um, so I think if, if we're able to pull educators together into teams, I think if leadership is able to provide kind of visionary guidance, but not necessarily a lot of micromanaging, um, you must use this curriculum, giving them the flexibility to really be able to delve into where, where do I want to see my students going and how do I want to see them move deeply and learn deeply. But, but how, how do you, this final part of this, what about, and you work with lots of teachers and principals, what about mm -hmm. those who continue to offer up but I'm so limited, you know, my superintendent is making us do this. The state evaluation system says that, the city. How do you help people to break past that to ultimately get to the stuff that you're talking about? Well, I would say our work has been um, kind of bringing groups of leaders together um, and really kind of pushing leaders to ask the tough question around what does success look like? Where do we want our, what do we want our students to look like? And shifting the focus from the student, shifting the focus to the student, moving away from this, this focus on um, whatever that accountability measure or that accountability bar is. Um, figuring out where are their strong practices, where are their best practices, this is what's being done well. How do we learn from the people who are doing those things well? Coming together in strategy and in community to work together. I think a lot of times there are people who are working in silos. I think too often we end up throwing out things that work well because someone new comes in and decides that it's a new policy, it's a new initiative. Um, there's, there's, there's always the opportunity to really kind of engage with us where we do um, a level of this type of strategic planning and thinking with school teams, which consists of the leader who sets the vision, but also the key change agents who exist within the school, but really being able to come together and talk about where do we see success for our students and how do we get there? And I think being able to come together and being clear and pointed around what those success measures are and what the actual steps that you're going to take and that you're going to adopt um, I think that becomes a provides a, a roadmap for both your veterans for both your new people to kind of come together and kind of move towards a goal I hope that was yeah. better that was clear no it was very clear and, and I think it, it ties back into what dr. Young said at the very beginning about leadership having vision being bold being courageous right being ethical um, not being scared and, and stepping up on behalf of your children and their families to do what needs to be done. You know, I, I, I was thinking earlier today about, about a film that I saw years ago. Some of you may remember it. It was called School Days. Spike Lee, <laughs> we did a film, right, on, on the campus of Morehouse College. And it was, it was amazing uh, to me in that you, you, had a young, uh, you had a young Lawrence Fishburne and Giancarlo Esposito who were uh, doing battle with one another, but it was really about the kind of differences that often get created within uh, the black community, uh, false differences um, that in many ways were put upon us as also pillars of, of institutional racism, to ultimately create false narratives to have us even fighting with each other. And at the end of that film, Spike has the, uh, the Lawrence Fishburne characters screaming out, wake up. Right, and I, and I think about that so much in the context of what's going on today, where if he said, if we could all come together and stop fighting each other, there are much larger fights that we need to be taking on. But we've got to stay together. We've got to be bold. We've got to be courageous. I am so beyond um, inspired by the young people uh, of, of all colors that I'm seeing out on the front lines today. 
who are saying, we may not have all the answers, but we know something is screwed up with this system. And we intend to do something about it. And we're going to make a lot of noise about it. And so my brother, Gil Scott Hearn, I don't know that he was right when he said that the revolution will not be televised. It's going down every day. We're watching it. We're seeing it. We're part of it. I think that revolution needs to be brought to what's happening in education um, on behalf of our children. We absolutely must emerge from this time and space doing uh, education and engaging in, in education in a very different way uh, than we have been. And I think the time uh, for change is now. So I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for taking the time to be with us. Uh, Dr. Johnson and, uh, is with me every day as we try to do this work on behalf of our young men. Uh, Sal, all the way from California, uh, we appreciate you taking the time and know how busy uh, you are in the work of the Khan Academy, and the great work of the Khan Academy. And we thank you so much for taking the time. Dr. Young was one of my heroes and a hero for so many. You continue to be the conscious for us as particularly as black folk in education um, and the work that we are trying to do. We continue to look to you for leadership. Uh, and I wanna thank you so much for accepting my offer to join us tonight and offer us some light uh, which you have had. And so we again invite everybody to please remember to follow Eagle Academy Foundation on Instagram and Twitter at EAFNYC and follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Real uh, David C. Banks. So with that, we want to thank everybody and thank our audience for joining us. Take care, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Peace. All right.